Maybe I'll talk softly. Uh, I, I realize that I'm keeping you from the party, so I'll try to make it interesting. I'm not keeping you from a good nap, though these are great chairs, and I won't be offended if uh, you take advantage of it, as I almost did in a previous talk this afternoon. Uh, it doesn't help if you stay up at 1.30 finishing your slides, although I did get to see the first goal of the U.S. Uh, Ghana game, which is pretty good. Uh, I'm Dean Wampler. I uh, work for TypeSafe. I do consulting and also focus on big data and Internet of Things related problems. Uh, I'm actually working on the second edition of Programming Scala for O'Reilly, which I'll be happy to get done, and I hope you'll find it useful. Uh, you can already get this talk at polyglotprogramming.com at my talks thing. Uh, and, of course, the slides will be on the uh, conference website. Okay, so to begin, I thought I would put it in perspective. Uh, you're here. Uh, imagine that it's early 2013. Uh, just to focus it in a little bit, uh, this is sort of a crude diagram of the whole data space. And it sort of begins on the left, often with lots of data coming in from various sources, you know, self-generated log data, clickstream data if you run websites, uh, Twitter traffic, you name it. There's all kinds of sources of data that you may want to ingest. And the, two, uh, the next two boxes kind of indicate two kinds of data that you might be focusing on, again, in very gross terms. One would be uh, like maybe relational data from other databases, uh, other sort of semi-structured data that you're going to extract, transform, and load. And this is sort of the thing we've been doing forever with data. It's only gotten worse with Hadoop. Uh, the former uh, head of data science at LinkedIn joked that you spend, if you're a data scientist, you spend about 80% 80, 80 of your time cleaning data, and that's not too much of an exaggeration. So this is one of the big jobs we have to do. And we may also have real-time events that we need to handle in various ways. Um, for example, it used to be that we liked to train, say, search engines maybe every night. You know, we, we crawled the web during the day, and overnight we'd run this big batch job to re-index the Internet. And uh, so when you did searches the next day, you'd have you know, an up-to-date uh, catalog, if you will. But that kind of sucks since we're always editing the web constantly, so wouldn't it be great if we could, as you know, changes happen, as a web crawler finds a change to my home page or whatever, that it is immediately reflected you know, in their search index. So a lot of stuff is happening on the events handling side, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, what, do you do, what you do with that data next depends a lot on your target goals. These days, a lot of people dump it into Hadoop, which they may use for subsequent analytics. Uh, you know, if you're indexing the web, you need a whole lot of big servers, lots of storage. And so you may put it there where you can do batch mode analytics you know, offline, or you might be writing it to some database. Maybe this is a data warehouse. You're taking the transaction database from your website and you know, offloading the data for further analytics. In other words, data that's highly structured already, and you want to get the benefits of SQL uh, to operate on it. And as a matter of fact, you can now use SQL in the Hadoop space, and it's one of the reasons that Hadoop is so sex successful that you can do that. So basically, there's three kinds of people in this world, roughly speaking. I'm going to ignore management like we usually do. Um, the, guy I'm call, the guys I'm calling data, uh, data is, these are your typical DBAs, your data uh, analysts that uh, may only work with SQL databases. But also, I'm kind of throwing in this bucket people who work with SAS or tools like that. They're, 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 basically, they're always hitting databases, whether they're using SQL or something like SQL-ish, whatever. Then there's this new category of people called data scientists. And the joke in Silicon Valley is that data scientist is another name for statistician. Uh, most of these people really are just statisticians, but it's a sexy new term. Uh, but, you know, that's maybe not too fair because, yes, there's, they, they tend to be very expert in statistics and probabilities, but also they know enough programming that they can manipulate uh, this data. So these guys will be using things like Python and R, and there's a new language called Julia that's starting to get some traction as a possible replacement for R. How many of you have even heard of R? All right. Yeah, now I know my crowd. Actually, how many of you have worked with Hadoop before? Okay, good. Whereas, of course, the dataists are using SQL or SAS, things like that. But the, uh, the rest of us, we're kind of stuck and kind of covering a whole range of things. We might be writing some SQL occasionally, 
but we're mostly doing things like writing these ETL services that are highly available, highly reliable, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're doing the event handling programming with various tools, writing Hadoop jobs, and talking to the network and to the servers and so forth. But I'm going to focus on this little section of this diagram, which is we've got data coming in. How are we going to manage it? How are we going to handle it? Uh, mostly what, why Hadoop fits into the picture and uh, what we're going to do in Hadoop. I won't talk about talking to a SQL database so much. That's pretty much well-trodden territory. Okay. So let's talk about Hadoop a little bit. And I think most of you have figured out that all these pictures are the Sydney Opera House. I like to put photos that have absolutely nothing to do with the uh, talk and my slides. All right. Well, if you've never worked with Hadoop, just a very quick introduction to what it's all about. It is a clustered data system where you try to make up for all the terrible inefficiencies in Hadoop that we'll get into a little bit with scale. So if I do lots of stuff in parallel, then I don't care so much if any one of them is slow. At least in theory, that's the way it works. And more or less, it divides roughly into two ca uh, categories of systems. You'll have some master nodes. Uh, for example, you'll have something called the resource manager and then node managers, where the resource manager schedules all the resources. Very clever name, obviously. Um, like your job. So you submit a job, it figures out, all right, you're, you're going to need you know, five tasks, and those are the things that run on these, no these server uh, slave nodes. I just noticed one of those is not centered, the nodes, oh well, anyway. Um, so I might need five tasks, and I want to put those tasks where the data is. So maybe I'll have two of them running on you know, the uh, first node and two on the last and so forth. So it does that kind of negotiation and figuring out when it can schedule jobs and that sort of stuff. And then you want to manage all of this massive data that could grow to the uh, petabyte level, but of course there's no hard drive that can handle that. So we have to uh, create a virtualized file system in Hadoop. It's called the Hadoop Distributed File System. There's a so-called name node process that manages the file system. It knows where all the metadata is, where all the blocks of the files are located. And now in version 2 of Hadoop, there's federated versions, so you get some failover, redundancy, and all that kind of stuff. And sharding. It turns out it used to be there was an upper limit on the size of Hadoop file systems because you couldn't put enough memory in one box to manage an entire file system beyond like a petabyte or so. But now you can sh even shard the data, so in, in principle they can scale to hundreds of petabytes. By the way, just as a little data point, Facebook has over 700 petabytes of data in Hadoop clusters. So the blocks, though, they're on these individual nodes that are basically big disk farms, and there's this data node service that manages the actual files that these blocks of, of data are in. And one of the interesting things about this is when you think about a file system on like a laptop, usually the block size, you know, the, the sort of the smallest chunk of data is like five kilobytes or something like this. It was, you know, a tenth that when I had brown hair. Um, here it's more like 64 megabytes or multiple zero because it was designed for spinning rust hard drives and you really don't want that head scanning over a hard drive because that's an enormous time waste. So you like to plant that head and then just start reading or writing data underneath it. So they're like really big blocks. And they also copy them in triplicate because as soon as you get to a lot of cluster, uh, you know, a big cluster with a lot of nodes, then hard drive failures become common and you don't want to lose data when a hard drive goes down. So they just uh, naively, and I say naively because it's actually more efficient to do in other ways, but nevertheless, they make three copies of each block. Well, it used to be, circa 2013, that you would write jobs to actually do the data processing in this framework called MapReduce. It was invented at Google in the late 90s in the Pleistocene era, uh, and Hadoop was basically a clean room re-implementation of both that file system and this MapReduce engine based on some famous research papers that were published by Google in the, like the 2003-2004 time frame. So we're talking about technology that started over a decade ago and has been evolving to the glorious point we are today. The actual MapReduce model is very simple. It's just a map step and a reduce step glued together. Uh, the actual reduce step is optional. You may not need it. But the gist of it is this, without giving in, into a lot of details for time's sake, I'm going to start a JVM process called a map task for each block of those files that I'm processing. Not, not each file, but each block of the files, because I may have very big files. 
And that's going to do the preliminary processing. I may throw away some of the data that I don't care about. I may restructure the data. For example, we'll walk through an algorithm where I might you know, read each line of text and then split it into words. So I'll go from you know, maybe one line of text to many words. And those of you who are functional purists you know, should cringe when I said this is a map task because it's actually a flat map task. I'm really flat mapping over these lines. I'm not mapping one to one, but just, just to be pedantic about things. So each of these, let's say, words are coming out of the back end, and maybe I want to get all the same occurrences of the word Hadoop together and Scala together and so forth. So there'll be this process of what they call sorting and shuffling, where the output of each map task will be sorted locally, sorted by whatever key I'm using as the output. And then it will be shuffled to a reduced task that you know, does whatever I want it to do. Whatever I data I need to get together on the same process, it'll, it'll just shuffle that data to it. So in a typical Hadoop job, if you look at the network traffic, you know, it'll be humming along, and then you'll get this big spike as all of this sh uh, sort shuffle stuff happens. And it's actually a bottleneck in the system. And then the reduced task will do whatever it needs to do to output the final result. Say I'm doing this uh, counting of words stuff called word count. It's sort of a famous example. I've tokenized all these lines of text of Wikipedia or whatever. And now I'm going to get all the occurrences of Scala together and Hadoop together, and then just output a count of each of those words. So that's what my reduced task would do, is just aggregate all of those occurrences. We'll see a few other uh, non-trivial examples as we go along. So it's actually a pretty simple programming model, and that's one of the virtues of it. When Google invented this, they didn't want anything too sophisticated, but they wanted it flexible enough that they could handle all the boilerplate of figuring out where these tasks ought to run, and you know, fixing the problem when some of them fail for whatever reason, and then let the infrastructure do all that work that I described here, and all you have to do as a developer is write whatever code goes in the map task and whatever code goes in the reduce task. But there's some problems with this model, and the first is that it actually gets really hard to implement even non-trivial APIs with that simple programming model. In fact, it's become something of a, a real matter of expertise. The people who actually know how to write MapReduce jobs and do it for a living have a very specialized kind of expertise where they know how to do that mapping of whatever it is I'm trying to implement into these map tasks and these reduce tasks. And they play games with how that sort shuffle process works and so forth. In other words, it's extremely tedious and it's not something that most of us would want to do and we just need to get answers uh, to simple stuff in some cases. And to make matters worse, the Hadoop API is absolutely horrendous. It's all of, the, it's all of our nightmares of EJBs all over again. And just to uh, you know, burn your eyes a little bit, I thought I would uh, very quickly go through an example. Uh, this is the inverted index. So this is a slight variation on that uh, thing I just described with word count. This is what you would do if you're building a search index. I've gone through the interwebs. You know, I've got these word, word crawlers. And they found like all of the documents on the internet. And then they've uh, gotten all of the bodies of each document. So that I have this input table, if you will, of you know, two fields in each row, some document ID, let's just call it a, a long, it could be the actual URL, and then some, uh, just actually a text field that's the body of, of each web page. Maybe I stripped out HTML or whatever, it doesn't really matter. And the idea is I want to invert that, I want to actually tokenize that text and then create a new index, the so-called inverted index, which goes from the words of the internet to all of the documents that have that word. And even more, I'd like to actually count the occurrences on each page, because when you search for the word Hadoop, you don't want to see every page on the internet that mentions Hadoop. You want to see the ones that seem to really obsess about Hadoop, because those are the pages that are probably really telling you useful information. All right, I can see some people falling asleep already because there was Java on the screen. I apologize, but uh, bear with me for a moment. So there's the usual imports. Uh, we create a main routine. And the main routine, you know, you know, it sacrifices chickens to the Hadoop god, you know, whatever configuration it has to do to get this thing to run. It tells it all kinds of explicit stuff, like, you know, the names of classes. Uh, you can see there's output key class, value class stuff, things that Hadoop ought to be able to figure out for itself, but no, you have to tell it. Uh, and then it, so that's the configuration, and then we run the job, and we haven't even gotten to defining what the map step is. Well, that's the next step. Uh, and there's all this boilerplate. Notice these long writable things. 
I have to wrap all my primitive types and all of my regular types in these so-called writable uh, things because they didn't like serialization, basically. And there's a good reason. Serialization is actually a performance pig. But nevertheless, it still sucks that I have to have this kind of stuff in my code. And then the, this is the rest of that main routine. And you know, if I ask you to tell me what this is doing, even if you already knew the API, it would take you at least a minute probably to read this and tell you what it's doing. And all it's really doing is it's just using the Java tokenization API to just you know, walk through that line of, of text and strip out, or rather uh, separate all the words into a collection of words. And this at last line, output and collect, is where I write each word out and then the, the location, you know, the ID or the name of the directory where I found that word. So that's the output. That's going into the sort shuffle process. And then I've got yet more nasty boilerplate. This is the reduce step. Uh, and once again, there's just a whole lot of ceremony and chicken sacrificing and whatever other pr uh, pagan rituals you have to do to go through this. But really, the, the while loop is the key thing. It's like as these values come into my reducer task, I'm going to iterate over them. And all I'm really going to do in this case is just write out a long string that has all of those document IDs with the word as the first, uh, say, key position. And I think I'm writing. It doesn't actually, one of the nice things they did is they sort of abstracted over like, is this tab delimited data or comma delimited or some other fancy format? Is it actually in the Hadoop file system? Is it on S3 in Amazon? Is it running on my local system? That kind of stuff they basically got right, but all this other boilerplate is just nasty, nasty, nasty. And this algorithm is actually pretty easy to implement in MapReduce. But if you really want to uh, really torture your eyes, I encourage you to uh, Google the secondary sort you know, like I do, you know, select foo from table, uh, you know, order by, uh, let's say, first name ascending, last name descending. That is a horrendous thing to implement in this API. But it's very trivial to say that in SQL, so why can't we do that? All right, here's the whole thing. Uh, those of you in the back, those of you in the front can't read this either because it's like, you know, one pixel font. Um, but anyway, so what are we going to do about this? Well, the first thing we could do is uh, use a better API, and this is where we're getting back to Scala. So Twitter, as you might imagine, has a lot of data. They have some big Hadoop clusters, and they were using a Java API on top of this ugly API called Cascading. And Cascading is pretty nice. It exposes a sort of a data flow paradigm, but it's still kind of noisy Java code, in part because it's pre-Java 8. So it, it, you know, it still it was kind of a pain in the ass to write um, your jobs, even though it was easier to express domain ideas like you know, sequences of operations on a data flow. But Twitter said, we can do better than this. We can write it in Scala. So they wrote an API called Scalding on top of it. And here's what the Scalding code looks like. So there's one import statement. Uh, I'm going, in, now there are some slight, just you know, full disclosure, there are some slight differences between what these a implementations actually do. I, put details in the speaker notes, but the gist of it is all I really care about right now. So I'm going to read some tab delimited data that's in some file, or that could be like a Hadoop path. Uh, and one of the things they do is they introduce a schema for, for all of these fields. So when they're using these Scala symbols with the single ticks, they're actually saying, well, that the first position you know, before the tab or the, the only, you know, there may be more tabs, but I only care about the first one. That first position will be whatever ID I'm using for my document. And actually, I'm assuming it's a long in this example. And then the rest of the uh, line will be the text of that document. And then we do stuff that we know and love already. We just slam this thing with our collection combinators. So we're going to flat map over each line and uh, convert so that the, t the little tick stuff means I'm going to input the ID and the text, and I'm going to output a word and a new ID. Well, it's actually the same ID, but you have to, have to give it a unique name. And then that, so flat map, this is our friend, right? We can use that to split strings into words, you know, zero to many outputs. And so that's what we're going to do. We pass in a function that takes a long and a string, because we just said we're passing in our long and, and uh, text fields. And then we'll just do whatever Java stuff, really, that we want to do. We can split on regular expressions like this. We could do a better regular expression split. This sucks. The one I wrote sucks for things like punctuation, so I might want to handle it a little better. But nevertheless, very easy code to write. You can bang this out in a few minutes once you understand either the collections API for Scala or the specifics of this API. And, but once again, you're back to that intuitive level of this is the operation I need to do. Don't make me sacrifice chickens to the runtime. 
And then this is it. This is the rest of it. It didn't quite fit on one, one slide. I put some gratuitous German at the bottom. Uh, das ist alles, that is all. But anyway, so the last bit I need to do, though, is use group by, something we all ought to know from SQL, where, all right, I've got all these words floating around. I want to bring them all together, all the, you know, the same word occurrences, and then just simply output a list of them. Now, if I were doing word count, where I just wanted to know how many there were, I would just do a count in here in this to list line. But in this case, I actually want a list of all those documents. So I'm going to output that and call that output the IDs, just plural. And then write it out to a file. So, you know, it's less, it's like, you know, 40, 50 lines of code. This is now a script. So this is one of the, I think, the deal breakers for me going from, you know, Java to, to these Scala APIs. It's suddenly I've turned a software development problem of writing this big, nasty program that's hard to understand into a script. You know, I can just bang on this script, get it right. I can actually run this on my local uh, workstation, whereas I can't really do that so easily with Hadoop. And then I just, you know, get it done, get it right, deploy it. If it's wrong, I fix it, you know, in 15 minutes or whatever, and I keep going. So it just com completely changes your world. Okay, well, we still have another problem. That stuff was still running on top of MapReduce, so it had, still had some issues. And another issue is that MapReduce is a batch mode system. It was really designed to handle the problem where I've, got, I've been accumulating all this data and I just need to run some analytics over all of it or maybe some big chunk of it. I'm not even thinking about the problem of I've got events coming in that I need to handle as they come in. But that's become increasingly a limitation because, like I said, people want answers faster. You know, if data's coming in that changes my world, I want that to be reflected downstream as quickly as possible. So one of the alternatives that emerged, or let's call it a complement, is a API called Storm. Has anyone actually worked with Storm before? Okay, it was actually written by Nathan Mars, who's uh, one of the geniuses in this space. But it's a really nice tool for you know, supplementing my Hadoop cluster with a real-time cluster. And Nathan wrote a great book called um, uh, Big Data, very descriptive name, but anyway, where he describes something, what he calls the Lambda architecture, where you integrate real-time and batch mode processing. Well, Twitter likes Storm. They actually bought Nathan's company, so they became a big Storm user and maintainer. And they decided, you know, a lot of the jobs we're writing are actually pretty much the same logic in, for both Storm and for Scalding. So let's write another Scala API on top of those two that will either run it in batch mode or event stream pseudo real-time mode. And they called that Summing Bird, which is a little easier to Google than Scalding, it turns out. Um, but, and I'll, I would show you an example, but it's really pretty much the same code we just looked at with, with just some differences in how you set up things and maybe a few different combinators that reflect what you have to do differently when you're dealing with events versus just a big block of stuff. So that was, one, that was the problem they solved with integrating Storm and Hadoop with one sort of uh, reusable API. Well, the next, maybe the worst problem, I mean, Scalding fixes a lot of the problems that, that everyone faces, but the, the actual maybe worst problem is that Hadoop is massively inefficient. So I mentioned you get this one map and reduce step. Well, a lot of algorithms you'll implement will sequence some of those one after the other. You, know, may, you may do one chunk of processing, then you'll get some uh, intermediate data, then do another chunk of processing. The problem is that Hadoop doesn't really understand that's what you're doing, and it flushes all that data to disk between those jobs. It could be terabytes of data that you're writing to disk. It doesn't matter. So it's incredibly inefficient. So just by solving that problem, you can easily get orders of magnitude performance improvement. And that brings us to uh, maybe the most important tool I'll talk about, which is Spark. So Spark started as a uh, Berkeley University research project uh, really about five years ago now, I guess. And it's gradually evolved into a very capable general purpose big data tool with an API similar to Scalding, but because it's not using MapReduce, it solves almost all the problems that MapReduce has. Uh, it's now an Apache project. It just went uh, to a 1.0 release. Uh, and it's something that really is kind of the future of what you'll be writing jobs in for big data in most cases. And it actually works pretty well for smaller data, data sets. So you don't need 100 terabytes of data to make Spark make sense. It'll be great for, you know, five terabyte sizes and things like that. So let's look at this API. 
And this one's actually going to be longer, but only because I'm going to do more work. I'm actually going to do that thing I mentioned a minute ago, where I'd like to keep track of how many occurrences of a word happened on each document, and then order by you know, the most frequent occurrences. The document with the most frequent occurrences I want first in my list, so that's the thing I show first to the user who's doing a web search with uh, my terms. So we do a couple of imports for Spark. Uh, actually, if you went to the Spark talk earlier today, which I'm going to recommend you do, uh, you know, look at it online if you didn't, uh, Spark context is sort of the big wrapper that kind of drives everything. Everything is done in the context of a Spark context object. So we're going to create a regular you know, object here. We're going to create a main routine. We'll start off by uh, instantiating a Spark context. And then we'll start reading data. In this case, maybe I've got some uh, data slash crawl directory with you know terabytes of web crawl data, and it's just going to go through and spawn a lot of processes, probably one per file or one per block, like I just described. So it's going to do all this in parallel, at least initially. Although the the two arguments here, local actually means I'm running it on my local machine, so it'll be all you know single threaded, and inverted index just is the name I'm giving it. So I'm going to read that data in. The first thing I'll do is map over it. Now here we actually use map uh, because what uh, this crawl data, once again, it's a two-field thing. It's some ID and then a bunch of text. Uh, and what I'm going to do is um, I'm splitting on tabs because I'm assuming it's tab delimited data, but I only want to split on the first one because I want to get the text all together and ignore nested tabs. So that's what I'm doing here with this array. The first map step just splits on the first tab. It gives me my ID and it gives me the text of the file. And then we do our old friend flat map to actually uh, split those words, uh, rather those lines into words. Uh, and notice now I'm outputting tuples. So here, one difference maybe you noticed already, I'm not going to actually name the fields with those uh, Scala symbols. I'm just going to work with them positionally and just work with tuples. There is a way to do this. It's actually the, the uh, Scala, or sorry, the Spark SQL stuff that was discussed this morning. But nevertheless, here I've just got first uh, an array of an ID and then an array of the text. And now I'm going to tokenize that, and it'll be you know, IDs, words, and then the uh, path. Actually, I'm inverting it. So what am I going to output now is another two-column data set that's a word, a path, or ID, word path, word path, et cetera. And then we get into some text. I really love this text because it's so elegantly concise, and yet it expresses exactly what I want to do, when I, at least when I know what I'm doing. Now I'm setting up to do the counts. So all I'm doing is creating a new tuple where I'm just going to add a count of one to each word, path, pair. And you can imagine I'm going to sum those counts at some point. In fact, that's what I'm going to do in the next line. They have this method called reduce by key, where the first thing in the tuple, which is that WP pair, the word path pair, that's my key. And it's just going to find all the equivalent occurrences and then apply this function to the value, which is an integer. So now I'm just going to sum up. So this is how I get the counts per document. What I love about this is, you know, you, once you understand these combinators, and most of you here probably do, although there's obviously a few new ones for this API, but it is very much like the Scala collections. It really took me half an hour to write this whole program, even though it's, it's longer than the other one. I'm just using the combinators I've known now for, for several years, and I just knowing how I had to reorganize these tuples, that, you know, that was the hard part, figuring, all right, what do I need to get in this position in order to do counts and so forth? Then it just all fell out because there's no noise, there's no you know, versions being sacrificed to the gods of the runtime or whatever. It's just pure domain knowledge here. And then when I saw stuff like this, I was reminded of something I fell in love with when I was 19 years old, which was the Maxwell equations in physics. Some of you may recognize these. Just an incredibly elegant expression of, 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 of a profound truth that was discovered in the 19th century, which is that electricity and magnetism are actually the same thing. So back to reality here, uh, I think I moved to the next step. So there's a group by statement. Remember, we had to do stuff like this. The, the difference here is that I actually can pass a function in that says how I want to group things. Once again, I just want to group by the words, and that will give me a collection of the documents and the counts. I think I have, uh, yes, yeah, so here's what the output of that group by statement will look like. Sorry, no, this is the output of the map statement above it. 
The output of the group by statement looks like this, I think. There we go. I'll get a sequence, for each word, I'll get a sequence of all of those pairs that were the words the same. Obviously, there's some duplication here. I want to get rid of those extra words, and that's what I'm going to do in this last step, where I'm going to map over it, then map over the sequence, strip out those extra words, and be left with, uh, then make a string out of it. And this is my final output. Each word, and just for simplicity, a long string with the tuples of the path and count, path count, path count. And the one thing I didn't actually do here that I could have added is I'm not actually sorting by the count, but that would be a logical step to insert maybe as, as part of this map step. So that's a little more involved, but I hope you see that just by com you know, combining these little steps and knowing how I need to get from one step to the next, then I end up with something that is almost legible on a screen. It's probably 100 lines, maybe more than that. But it's, a, it's actually the more, most advanced implementation of the three I've shown you because it's adding that count as well as just the locations of the files. Well, Spark also addresses this uh, real-time problem. They have a, a new API called Spark Streaming. It does a very clever hack. It, it basically says, well, what if we just grab like one-second slices of the data stream and then just use our regular operations that we've always had on those one-second slices. And we'll add some stuff like, well, we might want to do window functions, like give me the average of the last you know, 20 cycles or whatever. It's not a complete replacement for something like Spark that can do event-by-event -event processing. But for a lot of cases, that's all you really care about. I just want to, you know, maybe every minute or every second, even if I really have a fast data stream, I want to update some statistics or maybe retrain a machine learning model incrementally or something like that. So if you're interested in Spark, check out Michael's talk this morning. Uh, this is the page to the description, and I'm sure the slides will be up soon. And of course, it's being recorded like uh, my talk. But he, does a, he goes into Spark in much more depth and then talks about this uh, really interesting integration they're doing with SQL embedded in, in Spark to uh, give you the best of both worlds. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some other libraries that come into play here, and, and that would be libraries for doing mathematics in Scala. Uh, Twitter also realized that the, a library they were building as part of Scalding was really a general purpose math library, and they called it Algebird. Uh, now, it's not completely general purpose. It doesn't do everything, but what, what it's designed to do is to uh, solve some common problems when you're doing very large-scale analytics, like how do I do approximate algorithms, or say approximate counts of things. So one of the big, uh, you know, category theory objects they have is, is monad, uh, sorry, monoids. And if you don't know what those are, they're actually very simple. They're just a generalizations of addition, where I have a set of elements, say the, the, the uh, numbers from 0 to 100, whatever. Actually, that wouldn't work. It'd have to be uh, all, all the real numbers. Uh, sorry, all of the uh, non... What is it? Non-negative integers. And then some associative binary operation like addition, and then there's an identity element. So that's why it has to be non-negative. You'd have to have zero as the identity element, and then I can add any two elements, and, and I always get another element in the set. That's all the monoid is. Now, you might think, well, why, you know, once again, why go to all the trouble to abstract over uh, addition. That seems kind of crazy. Well, it turns out this also works for matrices, and it also works for a lot of approximation algorithms that uh, Twitter uses to, you know, get, say, 95% accuracy on counts over terabytes of data where you can do it in, in a data structure that's only a few megabytes in size. So a lot of the algorithms that they've added are just for that purpose, for doing efficient approximations of big numbers. Or, or big counts. And if you're interested in that topic, um, Avi Bryant, one of the creators of Scalding, did this really good talk at Strange Loop last year called Add All the Things, and I encourage you to check this out. Really interesting what you can do when you have this, this library that generalizes the notion of addition, and then you plug in different uh, you know, data structures and different senses of what addition means to actually construct a lot of uh, very powerful uh, operations. Uh, another math library I'll mention um, is Spire. Spire is really aimed at sort of a slightly different problem, which is very fast numeric. So if, if you, like, I actually did physics in school, and I did a lot of number crunching on little, main, many computers. Uh, basically, I would start my jobs running and come back in two weeks and see if they were finished or crashed. 
Um, literally, I'm not kidding about that. I bet I could run those jobs in like half an hour on this MacBook Pro, but back then it took that long, and that's why I have gray hair, by the way. Um, but anyway, so they have, it, this library has a lot of, a more richer set of, algebra, of uh, mathematical stuff, like types for complex numbers, quaternions, rationals, reals, intervals, uh, and various al uh, algebraic types like semi-groups, mo the monoids again, groups, and so forth. So if any of those terms mean anything to you, you might find this a, an interesting library to look at. All right, let's wrap up by just talking about why is it that Scala is actually winning in this space. And, and to kind of summarize some things that we've seen. The first one is that it's, it really is fantastic for, for DSLs. For, w once you understand these mathematical operations, you can just really create some elegant DSLs that let you construct non-trivial uh, applications with, with a minimal amount of code, which is just fantastic. Of course, it leverages uh, our old friend, the JVM, which has extraordinary performance and optimizations. And, you know, I, I started going, this is like 1 o'clock in the morning last night, I started Googling all the, uh, like, lo logos for all of the interesting projects I could think of. And, and of course, I couldn't think of very many because I was sleep deprived. But anyway, this is a pretty good set of, you know, JVM-based applications. Uh, and the last one I want to talk about is just the, uh, and this is something I think Eric might have mentioned this morning, but I, I unfortunately missed his keynote. There, there's a real interesting correspondence between our old friends, the SQL operations, and these functional operations, although we have a richer set than they do. So if you know SQL, if you appreciate the benefit of SQL for really slinging data around, asking questions of data in a very concise way, we're basically generalizing that and making it you know, more powerful for us because we're programmers and we, we can work with you know, harder problems, as it were. But just to, as an example that I made up, suppose that we created a table in SQL for our inverted index. And in this case, I, to make it simple, I just kept the, the first two documents found, say that the first two frequently occurring, just to make it simple. And then we could also maybe do this in Scala with a stream of data that has this, basically the same schema coming in. That's sort of the unimportant point. The interesting point is that we can do a lot of the same operations, and I'll just talk about a few of them. Uh, we can restrict some of the records we look at. We could filter for just the word Scala in our inverted index. Um, and similarly, you know, we can do that with SQL. We can do that with uh, you know, a regular filter in Scala. We can project out the columns we care about. If maybe we don't actually care about the documents, we just want to see all the words we've ever indexed, we could write something like this in either language. And we can do more sophisticated stuff like group buys and order buys. And, and I think this is a, a good example to demonstrate that, you know, sometimes SQL is hard to beat for conciseness. I mean, that's pretty darn concise up there. This is a little more involved. All of us could probably write this uh, uh, Scala code down here, but obviously we're writing more stuff. Now, I, I could have done a few things like just use underscores for some of the arguments and so forth. But nevertheless, um, sometimes SQL really even beats Scala for being concise. However, there's some things I think we should fix, uh, some limitations that we uh, you know, kind of maybe are, are slightly blocking, and maybe blocking in the sense of it'd be harder for Scala to really be embraced by most data scientists, for example. Uh, one of them, just a, a practical matter, Spark it has not as uh, battle-tested as MapReduce is as far as just you know, being rock solid in all kinds of weird circumstances. There, it's pretty good already, but it's, you know, it's, it's just newer. It's going to take a while for us to really prove that it's as, as robust and reliable as MapReduce, especially at very large-scale data sets. Also, there's a really popular uh, Python tool called IPython that's sort of like an interactive REPL with, with built-in graphs and so forth, which data scientists really love. Because obviously, it's, you know, it's horrible reading a list of numbers, but if you can put it in a graph, then suddenly it tells its story. There is this little project on GitHub to do something like this. I think it's basically putting Scala behind this IPython notebook. But it's kind of a, you know, it's a sort of a part-time weekend sort of project, and it's not really something that's, you know, something you would uh, want to deploy to the masses yet. And in general, data visualization is, is crucial for not only data science types and, you know, people managing networks and so forth, but even like, you know, the, the C-level people in organizations, your CEO, CTO, you know, they don't want to look at a lot of numbers either. They want to see you know, visualizations that give them the essence of what it is they need to know. So all of this needs, you know, these sort of other bits of the whole puzzle need to be addressed. 
And then diving down a little bit more, uh, I think one of the interesting problems uh, focusing on at, you know, performance at scale is how should we actually enforce schema? So both of these tools took different approaches. Uh, Scalding had you just label the schema, but it was actually, those were untyped fields. They were still basically strings for the most part. Whereas uh, Spark, you just basically looked at positions. Uh, it turns out the Spark SQL tool that Andrew talked about this morning uh, actually has you use a case class to define the schema of each record. And that's, that's great, but what happens if I have you know, billions of records that I'm running through my system? Is that going to scale? So I think there's some interesting issues to be worked through about how should we enforce schema, but yet also give us the ability to use very efficient uh, data structures and algorithms. For example, just arrays of primitives rather than you know, arrays of classes of tuples and stuff like that. And we could also always get improvements in uh, the primitive operations support. So, for example, um, we still haven't solved this problem of, of uh, specializing collections in Scala. We're still basically using boxed integers and so forth. There's a lot of proposals to address this, uh, but it's, it's a problem we need to solve, I think. Otherwise, we're going to have to go back to still using, you know, list of int, list of long, and stuff like that, which none of us, you know, that is, you know, not a parameterized int or whatever, but actually a hard-coded implementation. We don't really want to do that if we can avoid it. The Hadoop APIs are full of that stuff, and it just adds a tremendous bloat, not to mention, you know, redundant implementations and stuff. And even the JVM could help. We, we, we really want value classes, which we may get in Java 9, where you can put small objects on the stack and not the heap, so we reduce garbage collection uh, you know, overhead. Uh, we'd love to have unsigned uh, primitive numbers, like unsigned integers and so forth. So there's some things we can do to make things better, but already the story is pretty darn good. It, if you go to the Silicon Valley and talk to any of the data startups there, they're all using Scala. It's just like nobody even uh, questions it anymore. It's that important. So, I appreciate your uh, attending. Any questions? Shell shocked. Yeah. Because things don't serialize like you'd think they would, and optimizations really work out of the box, you have to sit down and actually move your pipes around and get everything hooked yeah. up the performance way. Is Spark amenable to, the, to those kind of errors? Did they solve that problem? Or? Yeah, so just to paraphrase the question, especially uh, before we got the mic. So there's a lot going on under the hood. And, and are there inefficiencies if you let the system optimize how it shuffles data around? Uh, and if you use Java serialization, which is fairly inefficient, uh, is that going to kill performance? And fortunately, a lot of work has been done on these uh, points. Uh, typically, Java serialization is not used. There's some very high-performance serialization APIs. Oh, like cryo? Well, you'd have something which you're sure is serializable, but it isn't, and you get that in the seventh flow down. You get this, I can't serialize this error. Yeah, so it's common use cases. So. Yeah, so there are actually um, the, the talk earlier mentioned this briefly, and, and he, unfortunately, I wanted to go to Heather's talk right now, but she talks about a solution which is uh, Sprout. So one of the problems is, you know, I've been passing these anonymous functions. If you're not careful and you capture, like, say, a, a, a field of a class, you're actually going to pass the entire object over the wire with that little bit of functionality. So there needs to be a way to constrain what actually gets serialized when you take those little closures and, and move them around the network. So yes, there are a bunch of uh, low-level problems that can nail performance. There's some ability to tune what's going on in both Spark and uh, in Scalding, you're actually tuning cascading under the hood. But it's still mu very much a black art, and I'm sure there's a lot of work that could be done to improve it. Any uh, other questions? Okay, let's party.